Criterion, The National Interest, The New York Times, and The American Conservative, where he served as editor from 2010 to 2016. He's currently a visiting fellow at the Catholic University of America Center for the Study of Statesmanship and has previously held fellowships at the Lud Ludwig von Mises Institute and the Claremont Institute. He lives in Alexandria, Virginia, and is a graduate of Washington University in St. Louis, where he founded a collegiate network publication, The Washington Witness. Well, thank you very much, uh, Marlo. And uh, I am the last speaker between you and lunch on the final day of our uh, terrific program here. So I will keep my remarks uh, fairly uh, you know, loose and uh, hopefully engaging uh, so that uh, your appetites are whetted for uh, our repast this afternoon. My topic is going to be the uh, justice of American nationalism. And I'm going to speak about that justice in two contexts. On the one hand, there is a foundational justice to American nationalism, to the idea of America as a uh, political community on a national scale. There is also a justice in the form that uh, American nationalism is taking here in the uh, you know, third decade of the 21st century. Uh, by contrast, however, I will mention as well certain less just forms that American nationalism has taken over the course of the past 200 plus years. Uh, so this will be a, a somewhat um, you know, sort of mixed evaluation, a mixed report on American nationalism. It is a complex subject. It is something that has uh, various facets that are uh, in conflict with one another, as well as things that are consistent over the course of our history, going back from colonial times through to the present. Well, I want to begin with the idea that American nationalism is justified by our own human nature that we are indeed political animals. But to be political animals means that we must have a political community, that that is part of our goal, part of our end, our telos as human beings. If we're going to have this uh, end be fulfilled, we must have a context in which it can be fulfilled. And that is the political community. It is our coming together as citizens and having a shared sense of justice among ourselves. Uh, a certain constitution, not just in the formal sense of the written constitution of the United States of America, but a constitution in the sense of a politeia, the fundamental philosophical idea that there is a constitution, a regime, that any kind of political community must possess. Now, for Aristotle, of course, when he thinks of us as political animals, he is thinking of that in the context of the polis itself, the ancient city-state. The ancient city-state had many attributes that uh, do not apply to a national scale political community like the United States. So the city state is, for one thing, uh, quite small. And it has to be quite small in order to have a uh, strong ethic among its citizens that allows them to relate to one another and to share in almost all aspects of life. The ancient city state is quite distinct from the modern uh, nation state of any kind and certainly very distinct indeed from a modern uh, commercial republic like the United States in that the ancient city state um, had a more or less comprehensive uh, influence on its citizens' lives. So the ancient city state was one in which uh, religion, for example, was very much a religion of the city itself. Uh, it doesn't make sense to talk, for example, about uh, uh, perhaps a Jewish Spartan or uh, you know, to have these other mixtures of a religious identity that is separate from a civil identity. Now, by the time you get to the Roman city-state, you can indeed start to have those kinds of distinctions. But as I will explain, that's because Rome is ceasing to be a traditional city-state by the point of, in time where its citizenship extends to people who um, are, can be newly considered Romans, but who would not have been considered Romans at the very earliest uh, part of the Republic. The ancient city-state had a tendency to uh, subordinate religion to the city, and it subordinated the lives of its citizens in almost all respects to the city. That did not mean that it was uh, necessarily going to be a, a totalitarian or you know, completely overwhelming presence in the lives of its citizens on a day-to-day -day basis. Uh, keep in mind that the ancient city-state was one in which the citizens really did have uh, you know, an, an active role to play in their uh, communities. Uh, that active role you know, could take uh, you know, one form in a democracy where it would be uh, a matter of going to uh, the ecclesia, going to the assembly, and actually participating. Uh, but it could also have uh, you know, plenty of roles in uh, more aristocratic or monarchical uh, forms of city-state as well, where you know, your role as a citizen 
uh, was related to your role as a, uh, you know, a mother or a father. It was also related to your role, especially if you, well, if you were a man, to uh, your place in the, um, the battle lines, in the phalanx, in uh, you know, your role as a person responsible for contributing to the community's shared defense militarily. So the ancient city-state is a model that is uh, quite distinct from any kind of uh, political community in our own modern time. And it may seem as if uh, the ancient city-state is so different from modern states, whether they are nation-states or anything else, that it is uh, a, a kind of bad example to give of the ways in which uh, political community works. But I don't think that is um, altogether correct. It seems to me that uh, Aristotle is indeed quite right, that you know, our understanding of what it means to be a human being is very much dependent on the idea that we are going to be, in the whole, political animals. We're going to be people who come together, we want to have laws, we want to have customs that oftentimes have the force of law or that have the same uh, ability to shape our character as explicit laws may have. All of these things tend to make for uh, a political community. And they are things which, you know, you can find them in tribal communities, you can find them in various kinds of communities that anthropologists will analyze that are uh, less than civic in their nature. But there is a, um, a flourishing of human capacity that takes place within the context of the political community that one generally does not find within more tribal, uh, loosely organized, sub-political societies. So there really is something you know, distinctive about our capacities for contemplation, our capacities for the active life, that are brought out in the context of political community, which are diminished, uh, less than fully fulfilled, within uh, you know, other forms of human organization, perhaps you know, more primitive or older forms of human organization, such as the biological tribe. The city-state, therefore, was a great uh, uh, revelation about uh, human capacity, and it is not an accident that it is in the context of the city-state that we begin to have philosophy as a distinct uh, human pursuit uh, that is identified, that is recognized for what it is, that it's within the uh, context of the city-state that you begin to have ideas of uh, justice that are formalized to a point that not only applies within the city-state to the citizens, but also ideas of justice that then begin to relate city-states to one another and to the entire community of human beings. Uh, even if you think of universalistic cosmopolitan philosophies such as you know, Epicureanism and Stoicism, these, these uh, cosmopolitan philosophies have a understanding of the cosmos, the whole universe, as being a polis. So the polis is, is fundamental even when you get to a universalizing tendency uh, in Hellenistic philosophical thought because that universalism is itself understood in terms of the political community, the polis. And similarly as well with um, uh, St. Augustine, you have a city of God, which again is analogized to a city. And that is uh, a sign of just how profound this uh, development in human uh, existence has been the creation of political community, the creation of the polis, the city. But the polis, uh, of course, has certain in endemic weaknesses. One of these being that uh, whether it succeeds or fails militarily, the city-state is likely to be uh, transformed by its experience of foreign policy, by its experience of conflict with its neighbors. So consider the case of the Persian Wars, which lead to the city of Athens becoming uh, sufficiently uh, powerful in relation to other Greek city-states, that the other states start to fear that Athens is abusing its power. It's using it in order to uh, you know, take the contributions uh, among other cities that are meant for common defense, and is using them to build up the you know, material glory of Athens, to build you know, uh, more glorious temples, and to consolidate uh, wealth and prestige and power within the city of Athens. So you go from a situation where you have a variety of city-states working together against a foreign enemy like the Persian Empire, to one in which uh, the other city-states start to see Athens itself as an imperial force. And the fear and resentment that this generates leads, as you know, to the Peloponnesian War. It leads to a conflict between Athens and Sparta and between the cities that are allied with uh, both of these uh, superpowers of the Greek world, Sparta being the preeminent land power of the Greeks and Athens being the preeminent uh, naval power. This uh, conflict uh, you know, is, of course, a civilizational disaster, a kind of suicidal episode in the life of the Greeks. And what happens is that um, 
by the end, all of these powers are exhausted. You have others that enter the picture after the Peloponnesian Wars, like Thebes, and uh, they are all so run down after a series of internecine conflicts with one another that you have a semi-barbarian kingdom, the Macedonians, who are able to come in and then overwhelm, uh, first of all, the Greeks you know, in any combination of uh, you know, uh, alliances between the city-states. And uh, you, know, you go from having uh, Philip of Macedon, Philip II, who is uh, successful in overpowering the Greek city-states and becoming a hegemonic power, uh, you know, uh, consolidating hegemonic power in, um, in Macedon. And then Philip II's uh, son, Alexander the Great, um, he, of course, uh, launches a um, trans-civilizational or even universal uh, campaign of conquest and takes, you know, uh, Greek forces and Macedonian forces out to the east, uh, overthrows the Persian Empire, and begins to build something which potentially could have been a kind of universal ecumenical uh, civilizational power, something on a scale so great that it clearly was not going to be a political community in the same way that the uh, city-state would have been. And in fact, um, something more akin to oriental despotism, to the kind of uh, consolidated power that you found within the Persian Empire, would have been, and to a certain extent was, the model for Alexander as a king with a universal empire. But Alexander, after his death, um, there is not a continuation of uh, the consolidated power under him. There is instead a fragmentation. You have separate kingdoms uh, develop and uh, among Alexander's successors. But you still don't have a recovery of a, um, or a or proliferation of the city-state. New cities are built by Alexander and by his successors, um, but they are part of these kingdoms that are no longer um, you know, sort of civic in the way that uh, the Athenian polis you know, at its prime had been, or the polis of the other uh, great Greek states. So you have this transition. You have a, a shift from uh, city-states in the Greek world towards uh, kingdoms. And while you still have you know, an existence of city-states that have a degree of self-government within the Greek world itself, they are overshadowed by the military power and by eventually the cultural prestige of the Ptolemaic kingdom and of other consolidated powers which are partly Greek, very, you know, they still have Greek culture, but they also are politically modeled more closely upon uh, things like the Persian Empire and uh, Eastern kingdoms. It seems to be a kind of um, defeat for the very idea of the polis and the very idea that there is um, a political community as opposed to a rule by a royal dynasty that is then going to um, subjugate to one degree or another, uh, the citizens who live, the, the subjects who live under it. So the city-state can fail um, both through success, you know, in the case of Athens overshadowing uh, its peers, and also through uh, simply being destroyed and overthrown by a barbarian kingdom, whether it's the Persian Empire, whether it's uh, the Macedonians. Rome provides uh, an example of a city-state which uh, succeeded so well that it wound up transcending the bounds of political community and transforming into something, uh, once again, despotic. So the Romans uh, you know, are extremely successful, first of all, uh, in wars with their neighbors in Italy, uh, over time in wars with Carthage, and then finally with uh, the Greeks and others, and with the you know, Celts. The Roman Empire you know, begins under the Roman Republic, but as the Roman Republic gains power, as it begins to um, have this uh, scope that far exceeds the scope of its uh, citizen body, it becomes more reliant upon foreign auxiliaries, for example, in uh, fighting the wars in the uh, late Republic. It, uh, you know, the power that uh, proconsuls and other officials out in the provinces wield is very different from the kind of uh, authority that's rather limited and temporary that one finds within the city of Rome itself. So even though the idea of a proconsul is that a proconsul has the same powers as a consul would have in Rome, in practice, uh, the proconsuls and uh, provincial governors wind up uh, becoming a new kind of uh, despotic power within their own provinces. And then this eventually uh, begins to influence Rome itself. And you have a number of uh, you know, great Roman figures, Marius and Sulla, Pompey and Caesar, who begin to um, think of themselves and think of their place within the Roman polity at that point 
as being something that is far greater than what the Republican institutions of the city had allowed for. And of course, Caesar's very name becomes proverbial for this. Caesar becomes uh, you know, the antithesis of the Republic. Caesar becomes uh, the, very bind, uh, you know, the very name for uh, imperialism and for the Roman Empire. It is the empire of the Caesars. The uh, city-state, therefore, um, has a fundamental problem that is theoretical as well as practical. And that, that theoretical problem has to do with um, the practical problem of um, security. Even though uh, security seems like a you know, kind of an immediate pragmatic issue, it is something that ultimately has theoretical implications because, again, if you uh, succeed well enough in your security endeavors, you will find that you may have an empire on your hands rather than simply having a political community. And if you fail, then of course you will be extinct as a political community. So either way, these pragmatic issues translate into a fundamental theoretical problem for the city-state. How can you maintain a city-state over time when you have these pressures which are going to lead to either strategic failure or to success that may be on such a scale and is likely to be on such a scale uh, over time that it's going to undermine Republican or civic institutions within uh, your city-state itself? There are also um, you know, divisions among classes and divisions among uh, you know, uh, property holders within uh, the classical polis. And these divisions tend to be exacerbated by the uh, foreign policy issues that I've just outlined. So when you have a division between the rich and the poor, that tends to uh, translate into a constitutional uh, conflict between those who are in favor of oligarchy, typically the rich, and those who are in favor of a more democratic kind of polis, which is the preference of the poor. When you have these uh, conflicts among the city-states and you have a pressure from the outside, uh, there is a tendency for one faction or another within the city to align with a foreign power that is going to um, create a revolution within your city-state that is going to benefit your faction. So uh, there's a tendency for oligarchic factions within uh, the uh, Greek city-states of the ancient world to want to uh, align with foreign powers that are going to support oligarchic revolutions. Similarly, there is a tendency for uh, democratic factions within the city-states of the ancient world to want to align with you know, forces like Athens, for example, that are going to promote uh, the democratization of uh, their neighbors. This creates not only um, you know, the foreign conflict that I've already alluded to, but it means that there now is uh, intestine civil conflict as well. And simply because the foreign uh, threat disappears does not mean that this internal tension between the few and the many, between the rich and the poor, uh, disappears. On the contrary, as you know, there are uh, memories of, for example, oligarchic periods that may be imposed by Spartans or democratic periods that may be imposed by Athenians, um, the, uh, the, the memory of uh, revolution tends to create uh, civil resentments that make it very hard to piece back together the kind of shared sense of justice uh, that the city-state had been predicated upon uh, you know, in, its, uh, in its glory days. Now, e even without uh, those kinds of foreign conflicts exacerbating uh, the uh, unrest between the few and the many within the city-state, there obviously are you know, existing uh, difficulties between the rich and the poor, and you know, occasionally you will have a, a tyrant, a single, singular figure, who tries to rise to power by taking advantage of the uh, conflict between the few and the many. So the Greek city-state was extremely successful. It did create um, an enormous amount of prosperity, especially by the standards of the time. It created a, you know, a culture which was uh, certainly unmatched by anything that had been seen uh, up to that point in human civilization. To this very day, uh, ideas of uh, political philosophy and indeed philosophy as a whole um, owe a tremendous debt to the example provided by the ancient uh, city-state. And yet, uh, the ancient city-state was racked by these internal regime problems, this factionalism, and uh, in having to address the security concerns around it, the city-state was put in a position where it would be, um, would find it extremely difficult to sustain itself, and where its internal factionalism would uh, be magnified by the need to uh, have this um, external power, this, this relation with the forces around it, uh, and that would lead to um, 
disaster. It leads on the, you know, in the case of the Greek city-states to being overcome. It leads in the case of Rome to uh, expanding its power to the point where it is no longer Republican. It instead becomes imperial and uh, the empire itself has a tendency towards uh, despotism. Justice as uh, citizens had understood it within the city-state is uh, not the kind of justice, uh, not the kind of rule of uh, power that exists under an imperial setting. And uh, you know, while the Roman Empire was indeed a, uh, an empire of law, it was an empire of law where um, you know, citizens had been reduced to a, uh, a level of, of subjects. They were you know, equal in a sense, but they were equal because they were all under this power over which they had uh, no control, which was the power not only of the emperors, but also over time the military winds up being a, a quite distinct force within uh, Roman imperial life. Well, the Western Roman Empire, of course, um, is, collapses. It uh, becomes uh, less important over time relative to uh, the eastern side of the empire. The east is where you have the, the most wealth. It's where you have the oldest civilizations. Uh, so, so the east is starting to eclipse the west uh, from a very early period. And uh, the west winds up uh, being um, overrun by invasions of barbarians, um, Germanic barbarians primarily. The, the fall of the Western Empire leads to, eventually, the creation of the feudal medieval order. And of course, you also have a revolution going on during the imperial period uh, with the growth, first of all, of Christianity, and finally, the uh, acceptance by the Roman Empire of Christianity as its own official religion. This uh, creates a profound break with the precedence of uh, the ancient city-state. So when thinking about why the ancient city-state is no longer a viable model for uh, anyone today, it's not just a matter that the ancient city-state had failed uh, in the strategic ways that I had mentioned earlier, but also the advent of Christianity transforms the relationship of religion to the city-state uh, or religion to the political community of any scale. The uh, city-state, as I had said, tended to have a merging of the religious underneath uh, the political, such that you know, your religious obligations were part of your civic obligations. Uh, with Christianity, you certainly do have, early on, uh, a very close relationship, uh, once the empire is Christianized, between the faith and the power of uh, the emperor and of uh, the Roman state. But that relationship um, is never quite merged in the same way that the ancient polis had merged religion and politics, because Christianity does, after all, have a higher power than uh, the you know, secular ruler. Um, ancient you know, religions had that to some degree. They had Zeus, they had you know, the other gods, but uh, it was the city that was responsible for all of the spiritual management of uh, the people. Whereas with the advent of Christianity, you have a separate hierarchy. You have uh, bishops and the pope, which are distinct from the secular rulers. And there is um, a sort of bifurcation that takes place uh, in uh, the human spirit as a result of this. And it's something that Eric Vogelin, for example, um, has a great deal to say, uh, to speak to. It is a bifurcation which, in some senses, creates a new forms of human liberty, that there is a kind of, uh, not just a liberty of conscience, but a liberty of uh, psychological distinction between uh, you as a human being and the polis or the political community of which you are a part. Now it may be the empire that you are a part of, you may be a subject to it, but you are also part of a separate kingdom. You're part of the, uh, you know, sort of, um, both the uh, kingdom of heaven, but also the uh, authority, the law uh, of the church itself. So you have a change here which is um, impossible to reverse. And uh, you know, even after uh, the Western Empire falls, even after you have a, a number of revolutions uh, you know, getting us into the modern period beyond the uh, medieval era, you no longer can uh, simply restore the ancient polis uh, because you have a change in the very relationship of human beings to uh, eternity and the relationship of their political communities to eternity. Uh, Christianity has introduced a distinction that had been unknown to Aristotle and to Plato. The medieval order is uh, quite successful. It endures you know, in a, a flourishing fashion for you know, uh, several hundred years. 
Uh, it is not a uh, political order in the sense that someone like Aristotle would have recognized, for the most part. You do, in fact, have uh, cities within uh, Germany and within Italy that have a high degree of uh, self-government. You do indeed have you know, some sense of civic identity as well as uh, a sense of being underneath various uh, hereditary uh, nobles and kings. Uh, nevertheless, you do not have the kind of distinction between these uh, 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 medieval communes that you had had with the city-state uh, in the classical world. Um, you have, it, it's, a, it's a curious um, situation that you get in the medieval uh, Western Europe, where on the one hand there are uh, vestiges of empire, including the Holy Roman Empire itself. There is a sense of the West as part of, well, as, as a Christian political community as a whole, the res publica Christiana. Um, and yet it is broken up into these different um, uh, feudal territories, uh, some of which you know, include uh, self-governing cities, as I mentioned in Germany, and in Italy, uh, others of which are completely under the power of hereditary kings and dukes and other forms of noblemen. Um, so you have this, this uh, what I would say is that it's almost a, a kind of federalism. Feudalism is also a sort of federalism where you have a shared civilization, you have certain uh, shared systems of authority. Uh, everyone recognizes during the med medieval period the authority of the Western church, uh, the authority of the pope. Uh, people who reject that authority are heretics. They are punished by the civil authorities within, you know, throughout uh, Western Christendom. There are periods, of course, when you have various kings and noblemen who try to resist uh, and uh, co-opt the power of the church. Um, you have an ongoing conflict between these two sources of authority. This, again, is something that is quite distinct from uh, the earlier uh, combined spiritual and political identity that had characterized the classical polis. During the medieval um, period, you have uh, an ongoing tension between uh, the church as one form of organization and uh, the secular powers as another. And yet this tension also is something that um, is reconciled and winds up um, creating a, a high level of harmony for a number of centuries. It is uh, not an order that is characterized by many of the things that Americans and others uh, around the world today value, such as equality. It is a, uh, you know, a system in which there is, um, even within the relatively free city-states of uh, parts of Germany and of Italy, there's a tendency for republics to be aristocratic republics as opposed to democratic republics. And uh, certainly there is, um, there are many limitations that are put upon individuals and uh, their ability to uh, break out of the systems of economics and of uh, political and spiritual authority that are over them. And again, you know, while the harmony endures, this is something that is uh, quite a remarkable civilizational achievement. And one should never think of the Middle Ages as a whole as being a dark age. Quite the contrary. Uh, there's actually quite a bit of technological development during the Middle Ages. Uh, much of it takes place in monasteries. Uh, so um, certainly the uh, crude enlightenment view of the Middle Ages as a period of obscurantism, of stagnation, uh, all of that is, uh, is quite false. It is actually a quite successful period. But it's not really a period that is characterized, again, by the idea of political community so much as it is spiritual community and uh, a certain hereditary authority that is, character that is characteristic of the kings and the nobilities who are the uh, primary uh, political powers within the medieval order. The city-states that exist in Germany and Italy are of uh, you know, relatively small scale and uh, most of them are of quite limited uh, power. There are exceptions. So the uh, city-state of Venice, for example, um, has a tremendous amount of um, success both as a commercial entity and also uh, militarily. It builds a little naval empire. In fact, well, not really a little naval empire, but a, a significant naval empire, the Stato de Mar, um, which is uh, uh, quite an impressive achievement in, there in the Middle Ages. The uh, medieval political order, however, the medieval order of society, uh, begins to break down by the 15th century. And one thing that you've had throughout uh, the medieval period is a conflict between Christianity and Islam. And uh, Islam is successful in taking a number of uh, what had been Roman imperial Christian territories and possessing them uh, you know, from 
then until this very day. So uh, North Africa, for example, was not uh, you know, sort of Islamic from you know, time immemorial, quite the contrary. It had been you know, the, the land of uh, St. Augustine. It had been a land of uh, you know, sort of rich uh, Christian tradition. Uh, it had been you know, a, a Roman imperial possession, going, a, Roman, a Roman possession, I should say, going back to uh, the Republic um, several year, hundred years before the empire. And yet, uh, you know, the success of uh, Islamic conquest is such that North Africa becomes, um, uh, you know, a, a, to this day again, a, an Islamic uh, uh, land. Similarly, uh, the, the Middle East itself is, uh, you know, put under Islamic power. And uh, Christianity uh, tries to regain these territories by way of a number of crusades. Uh, they have some limited success, but uh, in the long run, they fail. And uh, Islam is not dislodged from most of the territories that it's able to take over the course of the Middle Ages. The major exception being uh, Spain, which you know, had come largely under uh, Islamic control. Uh, however, you do have a successful uh, reconquista taking place uh, where the Spanish uh, push out uh, Islamic power and re-Christianize uh, Spain. Um, the strategic problem that is pre presented to uh, medieval Christendom by uh, several Islamic empires in succession uh, and ultimately by the Ottoman Empire uh, once we get to the uh, 15th century is uh, it's an existential threat. And the, you know, several of the reasons why uh, the Portuguese and others uh, begin to uh, explore new trade routes, uh, and they start out not by trying to discover, of course, the new world, but by trying to find uh, a way around uh, Africa. They don't know quite how far south Africa extends, but they want to circumvent Africa um, to go around, get access to the spice markets of the Indian Ocean uh, without having to go through uh, the Islamic-controlled territories of uh, the Middle East. This is obviously a partly commercial endeavor, but it's very much a strategic endeavor as well because the idea, uh, for one thing, the uh, medieval Christians had a long-standing belief that there had been a, a lost Christian kingdom somewhere in the east, ruled by uh, a fellow by the name of Prester John. And the idea was that if you could reconnect Western Christendom with this lost Eastern kingdom of, of Prester John, you could then create a unified Christian force that would finally be able to win once and for all the civilizational conflict with Islam. And uh, there was also you know, uh, immediate uh, strategic concerns that combined with economic concerns where uh, you know, the Portuguese wanted to gain access to the Indian Ocean, not just for the wealth for its own sake, but in order to uh, amplify uh, the strength of, um, well, to translate money into arms and to use those arms to, uh, you know, again, liberate uh, the parts of uh, the world that had been overtaken by Islam. The, at, at the same time, you have the Ottoman Empire in the 15th century uh, wearing away at the Stato de Mar, wearing away at the naval empire uh, that Venice had built. Christendom was, uh, it would be a little bit of an exaggeration to say that Christendom in the 15th century uh, was on the back foot, that it was being uh, you know, uh, overrun by Ottoman power, but it certainly was faced with a very serious uh, peer competitor. And uh, it was not by any means certain that Christianity would prevail. And the Ottomans were expanding you know, their reach into uh, Eastern Europe. They would you know, wind up taking uh, control of Greece. The Ottomans would uh, you know, pose a real threat, not just to the Christian East, but also to the Christian West. Um, so Christianity, as it was um, you know, in the Middle Ages, in the, the late Middle Ages, at the, you know, during the Renaissance, is faced with um, you know, the, the threat of uh, annihilation. Um, and it's again not a not a um, something that's uh, was going to happen, you know, in, in, a, in a year or in ten years. But over time, it seemed as if uh, very little could uh, resist the ongoing waves of power that had been exhibited by the Ottomans and by uh, various other Islamic conquerors. You'd also had a number of invasions from the steppes. Uh, you'd had. Uh, you know the the Mongols. You had uh, you know Tamerlane. Uh, you know a little bit earlier, uh, a little bit you know after Genghis Khan and before uh, the uh, the fifteenth century. And so civilization itself was in a precarious position. Christian civilization was in a precarious position by the time you get to the fifteenth century, and that is what um, incentivizes uh, the exploration first of 
uh, you know, trade routes that are going to go around Africa, and later trade routes that are going to try to reach uh, the east by going west. And uh, of course, they're quite surprised when they find a new land out west. They discover the new world. And uh, at first, this winds up being something that um, you know, helps to fill the coffers of Spain uh, with uh, gold and, and, and the coffers of Portugal as well. It's of uh, financial and strategic importance. But in the long run, uh, the New World becomes uh, especially important uh, as a, uh, a place for trade and economic development. And this is the strategy that the English wind up adopting. Rather than simply uh, having a kind of extractive approach to the, uh, you know, uh, the civilizations of the New World and their piles of gold, uh, the English actually want to start colonies in which they will engage in farming, uh, which will then uh, allow them to engage in further commerce. So they are you know, send going, uh, sending colonies to the New World, planting crops, and creating uh, you know, successful uh, economic endeavors. And it takes you know, a considerable amount of time. The earliest colonies all agriculturally fail. They are uh, you know, sort of mismanaged and badly run. But over time, uh, the English in particular are successful at uh, creating a kind of um, transplanting a certain kind of yeomanry from uh, England itself to uh, the, uh, the New World. The, um, and again, I want to emphasize that the colonial endeavor that the English are engaged in, uh, while it has a very strong commercial aspect to it, it also has a uh, religious mission to it. So you will see in the uh, corporate charters of uh, the Virginia Company and other companies that are responsible for settling Englishmen in the New World, uh, that these corporate charters uh, include a mission to promulgate the Christian religion. And of course, the English at this point are Protestant. Uh, they are under the Church of England, so it is uh, you know, the, the Protestant faith in particular that uh, you know, the, the English want to ex, you know, extend to uh, the New World. They want to have you know, sort of new populations planted over there that are going to uh, increase the scope of Christendom overall, and that are in particular going to increase the scope of Protestant uh, Christendom. And they see a great deal of competition with the Catholic uh, Spanish, and, uh, but they also have in the back of their minds the competition with Islam, which had been very successful uh, you know, in taking a number of territories in the old world. Uh, so there's this uh, civilizational um, uh, competition which extends from the Middle Ages through to uh, the period when you have the European powers colonizing the New World. The English um, have developed a certain civic identity by the time they are starting to colonize uh, the uh, North American continent. The English have a, um, a historical inheritance which gives them um, some surprisingly um, almost republican characteristics despite being uh, you know, a monarchy and despite having a hereditary nobility as well. Um, at the end of the Middle Ages, you have uh, the Hundred Years' War between France and, uh, and England. Yeah, that's you know, an unsuccessful war for the English. You then have a uh, series of civil wars, the Wars of the Roses, between uh, you know, English factions. Uh, at the end of that, you have the Tudor dynasty coming to power. The Tudor dynasty uh, wipes out a lot of the old nobility and creates a new nobility through appointment. Uh, the Tudors themselves, you know, they last for a while. Uh, then you have the, uh, the Stuarts, uh, who are originally a Scottish dynasty, uh, wind up inheriting the English throne. The result of the interesting uh, political developments uh, between England and France, and then within England itself uh, at the uh, end of the Middle Ages, is that you uh, get a, an English political order that winds up being quite conducive to the growth of what we would now call a middle class, what we would now consider to be a commercial class. You also have, uh, between France and England, because they had fought so many uh, extensive wars, you have a transformation in the nature of warfare itself. And uh, increasingly, the, uh, the common people are being pulled into uh, large, well-organized modern armies, um, which are seen as a, a kind of revolutionary force in uh, you know, the late medieval and, and Renaissance periods. Uh, in particular, uh, there is a, a, a sharp contrast between the style of warfare that is practiced in Italy, which uh, largely relies upon mercenaries, and uh, these mercenaries um, uh, 
you know, they, they do not have a deep civil connection to the countries for whom they're fighting because, of course, they're just paid, you know, uh, war, war, paid warriors. Uh, the mercenary style of uh, warfare that is practiced in uh, late medieval and Renaissance Italy uh, begins to be eclipsed by the uh, basically proto-national style of warfare that is practiced by the French. And the English, through their wars with the French, have also uh, begun to develop a certain military ethos that involves the um, mobilization of a great many um, uh, commoners who then, because they have this military role, start to feel uh, you know, as if they have a certain civic role as well. So in, in a strange way, the you know, classical polis have been characterized by um, you know, civic obligations to fight for your city from the very beginning. In the uh, late medieval and Renaissance periods, early modern period, you have uh, the opposite effect, where fighting for your, your king and country winds up starting to create the civic identity. Um, so you have commerce, you have a, uh, a, a certain uh, military uh, civil ethos starting to evolve, and uh, you have a uh, ongoing series of um, uh, a push and a pull between uh, the kings of England and uh, their parliaments, which are resulting in um, a, a kind of distinction between royal power and parliamentary power. And people can start to choose which of these sides they wish to uh, support. And of course, this will ultimately lead into a civil war uh, between the king and uh, parliamentary forces. All of this, however, all of this tension, all this breakdown of what had been a, uh, you know, a, a medieval, uh, largely harmonious um, uh, system of power that had been you know, fully hereditary, um, this gives way to uh, an increasing scope for individual action, both in commerce, in, in military affairs, and even um, you know, slowly, step by step, in politics itself. When English uh, people are colonizing uh, North America uh, and, and setting up the colonies that will become uh, the first American states, they are bringing over to the New World many of the ideas and practices that had characterized the increasing degree of civil engagement and of political community um, that had developed in England. And not only that, but of course, they are separated now from England itself by an ocean. And so self-government becomes a practice that uh, Englishmen uh, refine and magnify as they come over to the New World. Now, Sam Goldman in the last talk had uh, mentioned uh, the question of just how influential someone like John Locke was in creating uh, the American Republic. And there are certain uh, critics of America, including critics on the right, who would say that, well, because John Locke is a philosopher whose uh, commitment to both classical virtue and to uh, a Christian understanding of the order of the universe, uh, because John Locke is maybe a skeptic of both of those things, Locke is a, a philosopher who is very much interested in commerce, very much interested in a, uh, a limitation of the role of, uh, of perhaps religion in public life, uh, that John Locke is therefore a source of decay and corruption, and if America is predicated upon Lockean uh, principles, then therefore America's very founding uh, and its very sort of intellectual spirit uh, leading into the founding must be deeply corrupt in such a way that you wind up with a country that is going to be not just commercial, but that's going to be consumerist, that's going to be materialistic, hedonistic, uh, that all of this can be traced to the philosophical influence of John Locke and that you know, America's uh, constitution and declaration of independence, that these documents are expressions of Lockean philosophy. Perhaps they're also expressions of the social contract thinking of Thomas Hobbes, uh, you know, a generation or so before Locke. But in fact, uh, in some ways, this story is the reverse of the truth. Um, the Mayflower Compact, for example, uh, is in the 1620s, which you know, far precedes even uh, Leviathan, even Thomas Hobbes' social contract theory, and it's many decades before John Locke writes his two treatises of government. Uh, the Mayflower Compact, the Fundamental Orders of Connecticut, uh, which also are an example of self-government uh, within uh, the uh, English colonies. Uh, both of those, these things, and other precedents as well, show that Americans are developing a kind of contractual, contractarian self-government before you have the flourishing of social contract political theory uh, from Hobbes and from Locke. So in a weird way, the, the story is actually the reverse of what you normally hear. It is the philosophers who are taking their example from the practices of the Americans 
uh, as much as it is the reverse, or in fact, more than the reverse. Similarly, uh, America as a, uh, a new land in which property rights can be established for the first time is something that provides a, um, an impetus for John Locke in his thinking about property rights. Uh, in fact, there is a passage in uh, the second treatise where John Locke says, in the beginning, all the world was America. And that is because America shows uh, you know, an example of a, uh, you know, a vast land with you know, potentially enormous resources, even outstripping those of Europe, where property rights have not yet been introduced. And the question arises, where do property rights come from? And where does the justice of property rights originate from before you have uh, any other institutions to safeguard them? So I think we should not look at America as being predicated on Locke, but if anything, we should think of Locke as being very much shaped in his thinking in the context to which he's responding by the precedents that are being set by the Americans, uh, both by America's natural environment and also by the way in which um, English colonists are starting to develop a kind of, uh, a new kind of self-government. So the, the, American, the English colonists coming to America, they are Christians. They're very much motivated by their Christianity. Uh, you know, one of the things they want to do is to escape from what they see as a, a corrupt uh, old world. They want to come to the new world and create uh, you know, the proverbial shining city on the hill that will uh, give a, a, a fresh example for Christianity that will be less tainted by, uh, you know, the, um, not just, you know, their complaints about the Catholic Church, but also their, their concerns about the Anglican Church uh, being subject to uh, the power of politics. Uh, you know, it's, it's, an, it's an attempt to found a new kind of Christian uh, republic. And Sam Goldman's book, actually, After Nationalism, has a, a very uh, interesting chapter about this idea of Christian republicanism in the new world. The Americans uh, very quickly uh, develop a different um, understanding of themselves relative to uh, their English forebears. So on the one hand, they are taking over to the new world a, um, a set of practices uh, that have been developing towards self-government even in the old world. They are also uh, religiously distinct from many of the Englishmen. There is a much more uh, you know, a Protestant ethos among uh, the American colonists. Uh, Edmund Burke actually points out that, ironically enough, one of the other things that starts to drive a, a distinct political identity in, the, in uh, uh, England's uh, North American colonies, uh, the ones that will seek independence as the United States, is uh, the presence of slavery in the southern uh, colonies. And the reason for that is that because um, Southerners feel uh, that there's such a need to distinguish themselves from the slaves over whom they uh, lord their power, that they are exquisitely sensitive to the sense that they may themselves be subjects or perhaps even, in a sense, slaves to a power in England. So the, the Southern Americans have a very powerful sense of themselves uh, you know, as not being completely arbitrarily subject to someone else's power, of not being slaves. They have that sense of distinction. It, you know, it becomes a very powerful passion uh, in their hearts. And of course, it's uh, influenced by the fact that they are themselves being tremendously unjust to the men they have enslaved. Um, but uh, that injustice is one of the things that kind of fuels their own sense of the injustice of, uh, of English power that is starting to encroach upon what had been the traditional liberties of the American colonists. Um, the American colonists had enjoyed, as I said, a high degree of self-government. And as um, you know, Parliament starts to make more and more laws encroaching upon uh, the uh, Americans in terms of in circumscribing their, the freedoms of their legislatures, uh, circumscribing the ability of the Americans to set their own destiny in terms of trade relations. Instead, trade is being uh, you know, run by the English for the benefit of the English. Um, as the Americans uh, start to rebel against uh, these impositions by the English, the English respond by cracking down using military force against American civilians and also by uh, starting to interfere with and even suspend uh, the traditional English right to juries. So think about this. Americans have this you know, um, ancestral culture of English liberty, but now England itself is starting to violate those liberties. Uh, and this leads the Americans to uh, believe that it is time to separate from England and to start to their own uh, uh, you know, uh, union of polities and then beyond that a, uh, a, a, a you know, sort of national scale republic. 
I'm just about out of time here, and I do want to take questions. This may all seem you know, uh, a rather deep dive into history that uh, leaves open the question, well, what is the justice of American nationalism here? And hopefully my remarks have at least given you the sense that uh, the way in which the American colonies had developed led them to want to reassert a, a kind of um, political community, a kind of civil identity among themselves and self-government that um, partly was a form of justice that they had inherited from uh, you know, sort of freedoms that had developed in England, but that also uh, was going to start to be based upon the idea that um, the very essence of uh, hereditary power was incompatible with a, a civil freedom. And this would lead the Americans uh, to reject uh, creating a monarchy of their own, perhaps uh, in the form of George Washington, and to create a Republican form of government, ultimately, well, first of all, within their own colonies and states, uh, and secondarily with uh, the creation of the American Union, uh, first of all under the Articles of Confederation, and then ultimately, of course, with the United States Constitution. The United States Constitution is um, uh, you know, a, a very remarkable document because it is uh, an attempt to create a republic at the scale of uh, basically what we would now call a nation state, um, even a, a continental scale uh, republic. This is a tremendous change from classical republicanism and from classical understandings of the proper scope of a polis and a political community. Um, you, you know, in creating a, a, a republic of such a large dimensions, both in terms of population and also extent of the country, uh, the American founding fathers really were engaged in something that was truly innovative. Um, but in, in, in applying themselves to this innovation, they were both trying to serve, uh, trying to solve a number of practical problems uh, with respect to how powerful the uh, American polity would be uh, faced with challenges from Europe, but also um, to, to solve some of the fundamental problems that had plagued the ancient uh, classical polis. Uh, these problems being how do you, uh, you know, reconcile these factions of the few and the many, the rich and the poor. Uh, the other question being, how can you reconcile the tendency either to lose wars and go extinct or to win wars and become an empire? And the American response to this is to create uh, a republic which uh, is able to incorporate uh, you know, a, a high degree of federalism, a high degree of local control, even though there is a central government which is also uh, able to you know, exert its power over these localities. And through complexity and through the, um, through the powers of scale itself and the uh, diverse interests that exist within uh, you know, a republic of this scale, they try to create a, a form of justice and a form of self-government uh, that can prevail uh, both externally and internally without degenerating into tyranny, without degenerating into an imperialism that ultimately becomes uh, an empire uh, at home as well as abroad. This project is, of course, uh, beset by many difficulties. We have many, uh, you know, sort of uh, wars and conflicts and other things taking place uh, at home and abroad. And yet we have succeeded in, um, you know, prevailing in these conflicts without the complete loss of our um, civil republicanism. And right now we have, you know, uh, an enormous concentration of power in Washington, D.C., uh, but it is not yet a uh, kind of hopeless situation such as has, had emerged with, uh, you know, as the Roman Republic gave way to uh, a number of wars between, you know, figures like Pompey and Caesar, and then ultimately gave way to the, uh, you know, imperial system. Uh, America still has a republic. It still has a fighting chance. Uh, and the republicanism that we have is predicated on a uh, civil justice that is quite remarkable for having echoes of uh, the classical polity but uh, being able to address the difficulty of scale and the difficulty of strategic, um, uh, you know, um, strategic risk that had been uh, fatal to the classical polis. We also have a polity, an extended republic, that is uh, able to take account of the great change that Christianity has made in the spiritual development of uh, certainly of Europe and of uh, you know, humanity as a whole. That uh, you know, we have, it, it, it's easy to look at the fact that uh, our constitution uh, doesn't have the kind of uh, establishment of religion that have been characteristic of you know, sort of early modern Europe and to think, well, this means that the Americans are moving away uh, from Christianity. But the opposite is really the case, that rather you know, the uh, constitution originally was not meant to be interfering at all with the uh, 
uh, establishments of religion that already existed within many of the states. Uh, the First Amendment, uh, you know, it says Congress shall make no law respecting establishment. Well, that meant that it was not meant to abolish the establishments that existed in a number of states, uh, just as the federal government was not meant to create an establishment of its own. And the reason for not you know, creating an establishment of its own at the federal level is simply because Americans already were deeply attached, strongly attached, to their religious traditions in different uh, states and in different local communities. And to attempt to run roughshod over that by creating some sort of national establishment uh, would have been a, a tremendous transgression against the liberties of conscience that were so dear to Americans and that had led many of them uh, to come to the new world in the first place. So here too, we find that there is a, a justice and in fact, a justice that Christians can very much recognize as, uh, as you know, part of their own heritage with respect to the American polity as a national scale uh, republic. Uh, this is not something, again, where uh, the, uh, the critics who say that America was an abandonment of uh, the ancient precedents of Christendom, uh, they're not correct about that. Uh, America certainly is something new. It is trying to create a, uh, a harmony that uh, can take account of the developments uh, strategically, spiritually, and also economically of uh, you know, sort of the early modern period. And yet, uh, it's an attempt to do so without abolishing all the virtues that had come before and without uh, you know, creating a form of justice that was going to be purely predicated upon uh, selfishness or based upon you know, a kind of uh, raw um, materialism. On the contrary, uh, the spiritual inheritance, uh, the long-standing legal inheritance of the old world, these things would be key components, as would be the many novelties that uh, you know, figures like Madison and Hamilton would introduce into uh, you know, the, the creation of uh, an American federal republic on a national scale. This is, I think, the, uh, the honorable kind of nationalism we should always keep in our minds. The nationalisms that we see uh, you know, in America today, um, it is something that is an attempt to preserve the great achievement uh, of our founding fathers. So you know, while nationalism at different points in our history has had um, you know, a, a tendency towards uh, imperialism and has lent itself towards sort of jingoistic assertions, even going back to the War of 1812, where Americans wanted to kind of export the American Revolution after the fact to Canada. Um, while you have these many episodes of jingoism throughout uh, 19th century history, um, today American nationalism is actually uh, most often to be found on the side of peace. This is because the wars that America has fought uh, you know, since the end of the Cold War have tended to be wars of uh, liberal uh, ideology and wars of liberal imperialism. And you certainly see this with respect to uh, you know, a conflict like the Iraq War. The people who have been the most outspoken critics of uh, this kind of liberal imperial ideological foreign policy um, have been self-described uh, nationalists, people like uh, Patrick Buchanan, for example, back in the 1990s. Similarly, with respect to economic policy, uh, people who champion economic nationalism today, um, they do so not uh, because they want to centralize uh, economic um, um, decision-making, but rather because um, in a world in which uh, the American Federal Republic is competing with uh, consolidated, uh, you know, sort of uh, even communist nation states like uh, the People's Republic of China, when you have international systems trying to uh, overwhelm uh, American states and American localities and uh, local American economies, you need to have some sort of uh, national economic uh, sense of self-defense. You have to be able to defend these local economies and these uh, local forms of uh, you know, economic and political decision making against these global powers and universal powers of uh, you know, global commerce and certainly against rival states like the People's Republic of China. So I think uh, you know, I will simply conclude by saying that there is both justice in the original American nationalism that created America as a national scale republic and there is justice in the uh, kind of American nationalism that has proliferated today. Uh, as a antidote to, an alternative to uh, globalization and to a kind of liberal ideological imperialism, which has led to not the proliferation of freedom around the world, but rather to an enormous amount of conflict, which has often led to, uh, well, in many cases, the extinction of, for example, Christian communities in much of the Middle East. Uh, liberal imperialism has been a tragic disaster uh, and, uh, and a grave mistake and American nationalism is the antidote to such liberal imperialism.
So with that, uh, let's uh, uh, have you create your questions and uh, we'll proceed. Hi, thank you for your talk. Um, how can the spirit of American nationalism, i.e. the love of country and power, combat competing forces with crony capitalism and Eastern powers such as China? Well, I would say that's precisely the objective towards which it should be directed right now. Um, so a crony capitalism is about taking a part of the country, taking a certain faction that is uh, you know, very privileged economically, and um, creating public policies that serve only the interest of that faction. And we've seen a lot of that uh, in terms of financial policy, trade policy, uh, the, you know, it's, uh, you'll often hear libertarians object, well, we don't want to have an American industrial policy, do we? But in fact, we do have an industrial policy. It's just an industrial policy that is set by Beijing as opposed to Washington. So um, the, I think one of the major purposes of American nationalism as a political movement or political you know, inclination uh, in the 21st century here is to look seriously at the ways in which uh, both factions within our own country and also foreign powers are taking advantage of um, power relationships in order to further uh, extend their power and to uh, encroach upon uh, the liberties and the independence of Americans, especially you know, our, our sense of you know, economic self-determination has been greatly uh, impinged upon by our uh, involvement in uh, the World Trade Organization, by our uh, economic um, you know, sort of um, condominium with, uh, with the People's Republic of China. Uh, all of these things uh, have political repercussions. They are economically quite problematic themselves, but they also are limitations upon our ability to determine our own future. And, um, you know, I mean, you're always going to have uh, the realities of international markets and the prices that come from them uh, are going to have some effect on your domestic, um, uh, you know, sort of choices you can make. But uh, we should be prepared to say that, you know, not everything is about... Um, getting the lowest price uh, at the risk of losing a degree of political self-control and losing you know, a certain amount of economic productive capacity, um, material productive capacity, the ability to actually create things in factories that has strategic importance and that also has importance in terms of uh, keeping alive many of the communities uh, throughout our country. So we've had a, an economic policy that has often been great for Wall Street. It's been great for Silicon Valley but it's been rather terrible for Main Street USA. And uh, that, of course, has had political repercussions in the rise of Trump and the rise of uh, Bernie Sanders and the Democratic Party. And uh, if our uh, leadership class in both parties doesn't uh, take more seriously uh, what is happening as a result of embracing an economic uh, global agenda, um, you're going to see, I think, even greater political resistance develop uh, over the course of the next uh, 10, 15, and, and more years. Um, so people who are unhappy with either Trump or with Sanders uh, they really ought to be uh, correcting their own abuses as opposed to simply complaining about the fact that Americans are expressing their discontent by voting for uh, figures who are uh, a radical shakeup of uh, our political process. Hello. Uh, thank you for the lecture. I very much appreciate the subject matter. Uh, so I talked to you last night a good bit about what my positions are on like state autonomy and things like that. So hopefully... I'm not very articulate now, you can extrapolate and, you know. But uh, it seemed to me like most of what you put forth as a good uh, focus for our nationalistic, you know, impulses or whatever, uh, <laughs> as, as our founding, like you put forth our founding in a desired state autonomy and an actual federal republic as kind of what is admirable about the American tradition to a large extent. But it seems like that... Uh, has been very much undermined by our increased centralization uh, with the federal government and also just a general lack of really any substantial constitutional basis for our present, you know, status quo at the federal level. So if that is the case, which I guess you're free to, uh, you know, say why you disagree with that if you do, but if that is the case, then what should the object of our nationalism actually be, I mean, aren't we just being nostalgic for a, for a system that we no longer have and pointing to, I guess, the past to justify our pride in 
a present that does not reflect that past really meaningfully whatsoever. Yeah. Um, so the, um, the framers of the Constitution, um, they didn't originally aim at quite the kind of federal system that we have. And in particular, Madison uh, was rather disappointed that uh, the federal government didn't get an official veto uh, power that it could use against uh, state governments. Uh, in practice, however, um, you know, Madison, Hamilton, Jay, they wind up accepting the, United, the uh, Constitution as it comes out of the Philadelphia Convention. And they make the case for a, uh, a system that is going to be partly national and partly federal. And uh, that has been, in a sense, the genius of uh, the American people and their, their way of government, even going back to the colonial period, where it was not a question of being uh, you know, partly national and partly federal, but partly uh, imperial, partly connected to Britain, and partly federal, partly local. Um, so there's always going to be, I think, a tension within uh, the American polity between uh, a central authority, in this case it's Washington, but in the past it was London, uh, and uh, local uh, self-government. The problem with local self-government taken to its, its maximum extent is that you wind up with something that um, has all of the deficiencies of the ancient city-state and actually has many fewer of the virtues. Uh, again, because the ancient uh, city-state is something that is unrecoverable, uh, both because of the changes that Christianity has introduced in terms of uh, the human spirit and also because... Um, you know, we know now how uh, historically uh, city-states are likely to turn out. So uh, radical localism, uh, going to the extent of, you know, uh, secession, uh, states separating from one another into, you know, um, uh, just independent units themselves, and then the states breaking up into perhaps smaller communities, uh, city-states and things like that, um, that would be uh, an unsuccessful way to perpetuate American liberty uh, and for that matter, American uh, virtue, because you can't obviously have um, a, a preservation of virtue if you have a, a political order that's going to be uh, insecure. Um, so America has to have um, a, that, that you know, sort of national federal element. It has to have a certain amount of uh, centralization. The question is, how can you stop that centralization from overwhelming absolutely everything? And that's uh, you know, the uh, problem to which you have called attention quite rightly. And you, um, the only way to prevent it is through citizens actively trying, um, you know, all the time to stop it from happening. And uh, taking a close look at our policies, again, I will refer to, I think, the uh, federalist merits of a, uh, you know, sort of economic nationalism, uh, because precisely the maintenance of economic viability of our states is uh, an essential component to the political viability and cultural viability of our states, which then in turn is what prevents uh, an excessive centralization of, uh, of federal power. Now, one can make a judgment call as to where to draw the line about ex excessive federal power, and most conservatives will say we passed that line long, long ago. Uh, nevertheless, we have clearly not gone to the absolute maximum of uh, centralization either. And I would say that as long as we don't reach that point of absolute maximum centralization, we still have a, a republic worth fighting for, and we still have uh, you know, a liberty that is uh, you know, uh, sufficiently real that we can preserve it and, uh, and hopefully start to recover some of what we've lost. So um, you know, I, I think there's a great deal to be said for conservative efforts in the direction of localism and of federalism. But part of the, those efforts towards localism and federalism actually require national policies as well. Uh, both in terms of our trade policy, uh, you know, in terms of protecting the economic viability of our states and localities, and also uh, when you have ideological movements uh, that are either national or, uh, you know, sort of international, global in their scope, as indeed a lot of leftist ideologies have been and still are, you're going to need a certain kind of American nationalism to reject and fight against those ideologies and the policies that they would impose on the country in order to, once again, preserve uh, the space for uh, local self-government and for real federalism. So I think it's appropriate that conservatives are now thinking about how to use the power of the federal government in order to restrict some of the abuses that uh, leftists are imposing upon our states uh, and that you know, companies like uh, Google and, uh, and, and Facebook and Twitter, they too are using you know, the, the enormous scale of their power, both globally and nationally, in order to um, change the nature of local communities, 
and it seems to be absolutely proper to use uh, a degree of um, you know, sort of national power as a defensive measure against those concentrations of power outside of government in order to preserve the liberties, the freedom, and the character of local communities. Thank you. Thank you for your lecture. Um, so you noted the sort of distinctly Christian nature of America's founding. Uh, do you think that played a large role in maintaining such a large-scale republic? And if so, is that republic doomed to fall apart as we move further and further from our sort of shared religious roots? That's a good question. Um, and as a practical matter, uh, I'm just not sure um, how big a role uh, Christianity played in, in the extent of the republic. Um, now, conceivably, because Christendom had this precedent uh, in the Middle Ages, for a kind of unity in diversity, that you would have uh, an overarching system of uh, belief which was you know, recognized uh, from one end of Western Europe to the other, and indeed you know, Eastern Europe as well, um, that you could have that precedent for unity even while you have uh, local uh, you know, forms of hierarchy, local forms of um, uh, nobility and local forms of, you know, again, in Germany and in, in Italy, um, civic self-government and city, uh, you know, basically aristocratic city-states. Um, so maybe there is something intrinsic about Christianity that does uh, lend itself towards a federalism slash feudalism that allows you both to have a large-scale sense of shared um, uh, um, communal membership, community membership, um, while also having uh, a very high degree of localized and non-centralized um, political authority, in which case, you know, if America becomes, uh, as it has been doing, less, less and less Christian, then um, you will lose connection with that historical precedent. And uh, whatever fills the gap, whatever rushes into the vacuum that has been created, uh, may have more centralizing characteristics or more uh, fissiparous uh, characteristics. It may lead to uh, you know, more of a, a breakdown. Um, so it, it's a very good question, and it's something that I think uh, scholars and students um, should apply themselves to uh, considering in, in light of philosophy, history, and, uh, and theology. Um, but I think, you know, intuitively, it seems as if there is a, a, um, a harmony or a parallel between uh, Christianity and its, you know, sort of um, division of the city of God and the city of man and uh, the way in which you know, federalism is, is obviously not exactly that, but it, is, it takes a, a, a certain inspiration from uh, the way in which Christianity has had separate uh, hierarchies uh, of religious authority and uh, secular authority. And uh, that lends itself, I think, to a certain extension uh, that leads towards uh, either feudalism or federalism, but a, a kind of uh, you know, um, something that is not a consolidated uh, singular uh, you know, uh, cosmopolitan, you know, sort of world empire. Um, also, I, I think there's a good case to be made that the, uh, and this is a case that you find Yoram Hazoni and others uh, discussing, that um, Christianity was essential to the development of, uh, of Europe's nations as well. And the fact that we have a world of nations today is based upon uh, Christianity's success in cultivating uh, among the Europeans, especially the Western Europeans, a sense both of local um, you know, uh, political authority, but also of a wider, um, uh, a wider order as well that they can participate in. So it's, it's an open question, but it's uh, one that's very uh, suggestive. Thank you. Thank you for your lecture. Um, our table was wondering, um, for the people who don't feel a very strong sense of an American identity, who for either a historical experience or personal experience don't, for some reason, have any sort of strong um, affinity or patriotic feeling, um, how should conservatives who value that American uh, patriotism spread the message to say that this is something that people should feel affinity for? And how do we sort of reinvigorate um, within those who it might be a very lukewarm feeling, that sense of sort of civic virtue and spirit of republicanism that the founders thought was necessary to sustain the country? Well, the good news is I think uh, patriotism is actually natural. And uh, we have seen tremendous efforts being made by uh, leftists in the academy to really lead us to believe that alienation is the natural human condition. 
that we have no natural affections for family, for kin, uh, for neighbors, or for uh, country, and that really we are um, you know, simply um, uh, you know, these profoundly atomized and alienated people by our very nature, and that we only come up with uh, a sense of community as a result of some sort of uh, rule being uh, imposed upon us. Um, if you think back to, for example, uh, Robert Nisbet's uh, essay about Rousseau, uh, there's a way in which many uh, progressives in the academy try to write Rousseau's perspective back into um, all uh, kinds of, um, you know, uh, not just a political community feeling, but all kinds of human feeling altogether. They say it's all, it's all unnatural, it's all been artificially created. Now, having said this, one should not exaggerate the extent to which uh, patriotism is natural. Um, one should not take it for granted that, um, you know, people are always going to behave in a patriotic fashion because it is natural. But, um, you know, if you do think of um, something as being your country, if that is, you know, something that is inculcated in you uh, from the beginning, that you hear about, okay, you're an American, you have certain rights of citizenship, you have a certain uh, historical heritage that has come down to you, you have... Um, you know, a, a, a culture that is around you that is distinct from a culture that you would find in another country. All of these things, um, you know, give people, uh, you know, uh, an unconstructed, uh, a, you know, um, a pretty natural, you know, sort of um, direct uh, sense of what it means to be an American. What you've had, however, over the past, you know, 30 years and more have been attempts by the left to destroy all of this and to say, well, we need to, um, you know, because we believe human, nature's, human nature is fundamentally about alienation and that human beings ought to be alienated and that, in fact, it's more just for people to be alienated because then the communities you create can be created by wise, tutelary uh, political authority as opposed to, uh, you know, just going with uh, the affections that people wind up developing on their own. Um, because the left thinks that alienation is such a good thing and such a useful thing for them, they have done everything within their power to create, uh, to, to, to erase uh, the natural kind of patriotism that most people develop on their own and to replace that with an intense feeling of shame and alienation from uh, America's heritage. So that's why you see uh, progressives constantly attacking American history, constantly attacking uh, any symbol within uh, the built environment of uh, America of the past. And it's why progressives have been you know, constantly pushing uh, the idea that, uh, oh, you know, we're a single global market, we're a single uh, sort of global humanity, and we all have to you know, obey certain uh, dictates that are coming down to us to fight uh, climate change, right, which is global warming. It's a, uh, it's a problem that transcends nat nat national boundaries. Um, so it seems to me that the way in which we can recover uh, a, certainly a, a basic sense of patriotism is simply by rejecting and opposing root and branch these left-wing attempts to uh, instill and heighten a sense of alienation. So in large part, uh, our efforts should be uh, defensive. It should throw out uh, these left-wing distortions of human nature. Um, civic virtue is very hard to create, and that really is a matter of um, you know, sort of neighborhoods and uh, a very localized ethos as opposed to one that uh, can be created uh, nationally. And there I do perhaps agree to some extent with those who, who you know, say that, um, you know, it's not that patriotism is unnatural, but patriotism is, is rather broad and loose, whereas neighborliness is uh, much more concrete and much more, you know, sort of immediately felt. Um, so one of the things we have to do is, as my previous remarks and previous questions have indicated, is get back to a sense of the strength of our localities, the importance of our localities within the national framework. Uh, because those localities and the little platoons, the families, those are the places where patriotism is most intensely inculcated. Uh, you can't do it simply by you know, adopting national standards for um, you know, um, secondary education or something like that, which has often been the folly of um, uh, you know, certain parts of the conservative movement. Now, it can be, you know, fine to have certain national standards of, of education, but that's not what's really going to create a sense of patriotism in the heart. It's instead going to be, uh, you know, the kind of neighborly relations and uh, the, the sense of devotion to our families from which you will then have a, a kind of ladder leading up to uh, a very passionate, uh, you know, 
patriotism that is not just you know sort of felt in a, in a vague way, but is felt okay. I am I am uh, you know sort of loyal to America because you know my family is part of America and my local neighborhood is part of America. That scale of affections being you know tightly integrated uh, is what creates a successful patriotism. Um, and I think the way to do that is both to fight against left-wing attempts to promote alienation and also to fight against uh, you know the things that have disempowered our local communities. Thank you. You guys can save any lingering questions you have for Dan during hospitality. Uh, thank you for your talk, appreciate it. Um, so it, it seems that you, you kind of constructed a, a very broad, rich, and you know, uh, just history of uh, nationalism. Um, and I think towards the end, you kind of uh, narrowed it down to a specific point of policy prescription for economic nationalism. And I'm curious, can we have any difference there in that specific policy? I mean, is there, is there room for someone who is not so uh, committed to that more of a statist approach? Yeah, I would first of all reject that it's a, uh, a statist approach. Um, as I say, I don't think that um, the libertarian dream of uh, trade going on without any kind of government uh, putting its thumb on the uh, scales is, um, is achievable. I think what we actually have is a system in which uh, you know, trade policy is being written. It's just not being written by representatives of Americans. It's being written by the Chinese Communist Party. Um, but be that as it may, you, um, I, your question is uh, an important one, and it is um, there's an assumption that it, uh, behind it that is quite correct, I think. And one reason why I think the word nationalism is useful, especially today, is precisely because you don't want to say that anyone who disagrees with a particular policy perspective of yours is necessarily unpatriotic. So yes, there's certainly room for patriots to disagree about appropriate policies. I think nationalism is a useful label for a certain set of ideas right now because they are attempts to reassert national sovereignty, uh, citizenship, borders, uh, you know, a whole panoply of related issues. Um, within the context of uh, a, a global economy and within the context of the universalism of liberal or left-wing progressive ideology. So nationalism is a way to say that, you know, we, we should be a self-governing community of citizens and we should have a, an economy which enables us to maintain our independence as citizens rather than making us part of a, you know, uh, a much larger um, system of power where you know uh, people who are willing to use their own uh, you know state advantages like the Chinese uh, are uh, able to dictate basically how we live our lives and you've seen a lot of that you know taking place over the last thirty plus years. Um, however, I think there are you know sort of uh, there are wise libertarian objections to certain kinds of you know economic nationalist policies. There are legitimate concerns about crony capitalism or about um, you know, kind of protecting inefficient industries. Um, and so it's, it's useful to listen to those critics. But I do think that one can listen to those critics and take account of, you know, the, uh, the temptations and, uh, and the defects of even a good policy, while at the same time saying, but we do need uh, to make sure that we are not simply a country of, um, you know, kind of hair braiders on the one hand and Wall Street tycoons or, you know, Facebook commissars on the other, that we actually do need to have a productive economy. Uh, just as we have one in agriculture, we need to have in industry an ability to make and provide things both for ourselves and also, uh, you know, for a, a global market. Because I think that's the other side to economic nationalism that tends to get overlooked. People think of it just in terms of autarky, in terms of self-sufficiency, and that certainly is a component. But really the idea is that you know, a successful economic nationalism is about making sure that we are a competitive country that is making things that the rest of the world wants to buy and that we have markets that are open to us, um, which is not the case right now because in fact, you know, uh, very few American products are allowed on the Chinese market, for example. And uh, when China does you know, sort of half open its markets to American goods, it always insists that a, a, an American company have a local partner that it works with. That local partner in China will then steal intellectual property and will generally you know, uh, be prepared to take over the market uh, when the time comes for them to push out uh, the American uh, company that has been given a, a sort of temporary foothold in the door, but that ultimately is uh, simply uh, being duped into uh, uh, a relationship that will advantage China and not the American company. Thank you. 